so much. So children third through sixth grade uh, are leaving for a special worship time uh, over this way, Brother James, right over here. So I'm uh, so glad that you're here to worship with us today. Again, I want to ask you to open your Bibles and be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And when you found 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would, just look this way. I want to speak to you today on the subject, turning temptations into triumphs. I walked into a uh, local uh, business and I saw on the countertop, you know, sometimes they'll put pithy sayings or, or something really, you know, some sort of uh, homespun wisdom on the wall that everybody can see when they walk into the business. And, and uh, this one caught my attention because I'd never seen it before. And it had a simple message and this is what it said. Opportunity knocks only once. <laughs> Temptation leans on the doorbell. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, that was uh, some truth that was just perfect uh, because it is so true. As long as you and I are in this life, we will always be within arm's reach of temptation. I mean, you don't have to go looking for temptation. Temptation finds you, right? And so what we're talking about this morning, we're talking about something that's very real in the lives of all of us. But I just want to say, as we think about this topic this morning, that temptation is not something that happens to us because we are sinful. And our biblical understanding of that is this, Jesus was tempted. The reason why you and I are tempted is simply because we are human. And today what I'm going to show you from God's Word is that when rightly handled, temptations can draw us closer to God, not drive a wedge between us and God. So this is an area of interest to all of us, and I want us to see how God allows temptation in order to be a tool in His hands, in His way, that will help us come closer to Jesus, not farther away from Jesus. Now follow along in God's Word in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where we read these words beginning in verse 12. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity, but God is faithful. He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation He will also provide a way of escape so that you may be able to. To bear it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we know that your word says you don't tempt anybody, you don't cause temptation. It's just one more thing about being in this world that as your creation, we are constantly pointed <coughs> to our need of you. Father, we cannot understand or receive truth unless You open our minds and our hearts to receive it. And so today, Holy Spirit, we ask that You would take the truths that are in the Word of God and we ask that You would take Your Holy Word into our hearts so that we can know victory and turn temptation into triumph. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, just a very short background as to Paul writing to this particular group of people. It's called the Letter to the Corinthians. And he wrote uh, two letters that we have in the Bible, but there's actually uh, uh, a reason to believe that he might have written more letters, but we don't have them included in our uh, Bible. So in this first letter, Paul's writing to people who are a part of a church where most of the people in the church are fairly new believers. Uh, Paul had uh, made his way uh, from the Middle East and Asia Minor and made his way over to the European continent 
And as he went from city to city, he shared the gospel. And he went to the city of Athens, which was the great capital of Greece. And Corinth is just 40 miles east of Athens, located on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It's a very large seaport, a very large city at that time when this letter was written. And so Paul visits this city and he goes to a synagogue where he knows he will find some Jewish believers. And in the synagogue, he shares the gospel message going and using just the Old Testament only to talk to them about the Messiah that God promised he would send and that God had fulfilled his promise in sending Jesus to be the Savior of the world. And the Bible tells us there that uh, what happened was some of the people in the city of Corinth received Jesus and many of these people were coming out of a, an educated culture, but a very uh, pagan and corrupt culture. Just to describe that for you a little bit, uh, Corinth was a world trade center. People from all over Greece came there to conduct trade, but not only uh, Greece, but also from Northern Africa and from the Middle East. People would make their way to Corinth, so there's a large trade center, a very prosperous city. On top of that, Corinth was the location of the Isthmian Games. Now, you've heard of the Olympic Games, right? And uh, the Olympian Games, of course, are associated with Athens, 40 miles from Corinth. But the second largest games that was uh, taking place in the world occurred in the city of Corinth, and it was called the Isthmian Games. And it was a great group, great crowds. Many people would come. People from all over the world would come to compete. But Corinth, like most uh, uh, Greek cities, had an acropolis that rose 2,000 feet above the city. And the Acropolis was key because the Acropolis was used for the defense of the city, but also for religious worship. On the Acropolis in Corinth, there was a temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. The temple of Aphrodite had a thousand priestesses who were prostitutes who serviced those who came to worship at the temple of Aphrodite. Now in the evening, those prostitutes would come down from the temple and offer their services to those who were in the city. Corinth was a very vital place with a lot of temptations. You've got a group of new Christians Paul has moved on to plant other churches. He's now writing back to them and he's talking to them about very real issues, things that are going on in their life. And some of the Corinthian Christians had succumbed to temptation and had entered into a sinful lifestyle. Now they had come out of it so we could see how they would be tempted right, to go right back into it. Are you with me? This is a very real letter to a very real group of people who were experiencing very real temptations and they were yielding and they were losing their testimony as Christians. So Paul writes to them and he says, I want to speak to you about the temptations that you're going through. And so he sends this message and gives these words of advice to them. Now, it's a very real message for us. Did you know there are three basic ways that you and I can respond to temptation. Number one, you can give into it. Three ways we can respond to temptation. You can give into it. That's one way. I, I mean, uh, you know, if it feels good, do That's the way of animals. Living on the animal plane is that an animal lives for self-propagation. An animal is someone who lives for uh, self-preservation. An animal lives for self-gratification. And a lot of Christians and a lot of people in our world, rather a lot of humans in our world, are living just like that. If it feels good, do it. They're like the man who said, you know, I can overcome anything except temptation. One way is just give in to it. There's another way that many people face temptation, that is fight. Fight it. 
Some try to fight temptation in the strength of the flesh. Uh, they're always battling. Uh, just uh, uh, fighting and fighting and fighting. And uh, they're just the opposite of those who just give in to it. They're trying to fight it. Now, they're constantly struggling, constantly fighting, and constantly failing. Because they're trying to do it in the strength of their own flesh. Now, let's just be honest. We've all been there, right? We've all been there. I heard about a lady on a diet. Donuts were a no diet. But on her way to work, she had to drive by a donut shop. Temptation whispered in her ear, just, just think how good a fresh donut. Good luck. Cut the coffee. Be right back. Well, she kept hearing that in her ear. And she thought to herself, well, you know, I'll stop, but only, 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 only if there's a parking space right in front of the front door. <laughs> well, she rolled up on the donut shop. And believe it or not, on her third trip around the world, she found a <laughs> There it was, must be problems, parking spot right in front of the door. Well, we try to fight temptation to flesh a lot of times and we fail. But there's a third way that we can face temptation, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. And that is we can overcome temptation through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we can live victoriously whether our temptation is in the realm of dishonesty or overeating or lust or laziness or gospel, whatever, uh, gossip, whatever it is, we don't have to be slaves to the flesh and to the devil and to the world. The Bible tells us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So this morning I want us to look at this passage of Scripture and I want us to expand on it by going to other parts of the Bible that speak to us about how we can turn our temptations into triumphs. First of all, I want us to notice the subjects of temptation. The subjects of temptation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at that verse 13. No temptation has come upon you except, and look at this phrase, is common to humanity, common to humanity. So we're talking about the subjects of temptation. The subjects of temptation are who? You and me. Who is temptation? We are temptation. All of us experience temptation. We're going to be bombarded with temptations in the areas of materialism, in the areas of sex, in the areas of greed, in the area of pride. Being saved doesn't make us exempt from temptation. It's not a pass. We're not immune to temptation. And being tempted, friends, is not a sin. Are you with me? You understand that? We're all tempted, and being tempted in and of itself is not a sin. Jesus, remember, was tempted in all ways as we are, and yet he was without sin. But in verse 12, look at your Bible. Paul gives us a warning. And in verse 12, he says this. Whoever thinks he stands, be careful, lest he fall. Paul is speaking to the overconfident person. He's speaking to the person who's leading an unguarded, undisciplined life. And he says to the proud person, listen, the proud person is the person who tempts the devil to tempt him. And because we're overconfident, we think we can enter in and play around with things and not get burned. But the reality is, the Bible tells us that the person who is in the greatest danger is the person who is trying to fight temptation in the strength of his own flesh. Without Christ, we cannot overcome temptation. There's just no way we can fight it and win in the flesh. Now, have you ever had this thought? Well, why did God think up a plan where it would include temptation or permit it to be included in this old world? I mean, why doesn't God just do away with temptation. Why didn't, as a matter of fact, why didn't we just destroy the devil? Well, well you're getting ahead of me. 
That's all going to be dealt with for sure in the future. But that's not God's plan for us now. God's plan is not immunity from temptation, but victory over temptation. Remember, even Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, and yet without sin. The reason we are subject to temptation is so we can learn about how to depend on the Lord Jesus Christ and no victory. God wants us to triumph in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, I want you to think of me about football for just a second. Many of you have played or watched football in the past. I mean, what a marvelous game. Interesting. Fashion. I mean, you take a bag full of air, you zip it up, it's got a point on both ends of it, and uh, you go out to a converted cow pasture with ten other people, and you declare, we're going to take this zip that bag of air, and we're going to go down to the other end of the field. Then you got 11 guys on the other side who are saying, oh, no, we're not. And then the first team answers back, oh, yes, we are. And then a struggle ensues. And they go back and forth. And they're hitting heads. And they're knocking each other down on the ground. Until eventually, one team crosses what they call the goal line. And a celebration erupts. You ever wondered why a football team doesn't dress up and go out into that cow pasture on Tuesday about 9 a.m. instead of Saturday afternoon? I mean, just think about it. They get in their uniforms, they go out there, there's no opponent. They can just go up and down the field and score all the points they can. They can go in and see the scoreboard. The scoreboard on the whole to figures. They can just go into triple figure score on every play. You know why they don't do that? Because there's no victory in that. <laughs> there's no bragging rights. There's no celebration. There's no band playing. There's no hoorah in that. God's plan, friends, is for us to experience victory over our opponent. He wants to get the glory to Himself by seeing you and me triumph <laughs> through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's the subject of temptation. I want you to think with me for just a moment about the source of temptation. The source of temptation. Who is our opponent? Where does temptation come from? It comes from one of three sources. And those three sources are, you ready? Those three sources are the world, the flesh, and the devil. Our temptations are not unique. Don't you get the idea that you're somebody extra special because you're uniquely tempted and nobody else has ever been tempted exactly the way that you are tempted? When we are tempted, did you know we're all tempted in just basically the same three ways? And I want to look at those this morning. First of all, I want to talk to you about our external foe. Our external foe is the world. Our external foe, foe is the world. Listen to what 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now that's 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. James chapter 4 verse 4 says this, Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? For whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, did you notice over and over in those verses that you kept coming across this phrase, the world? Well, what is that talking about? The world that is mentioned in these verses is not talking about planet Earth. It's not uh, talking about uh, the world. When it says the world, <coughs> it does not mean we are not to, have, uh, to love the people in the world. We know the Bible commands us that we're to love everybody. 
Uh, it also is telling us that uh, in this world there is the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and uh, uh, the lust of the eyes. All of these things are a part of an evil world system that is a mindset, an anti-God mindset that you can kind of play by your own rules and somehow that's going to be okay that there's really no absolute truth. You just kind of, you know, whatever fits you, whatever applies to you, whatever works for you, then, then that's for you. And something else may be for somebody else, but that's, that's the way it works for you. There's a mindset in our world that goes like that and it's kind of a sliding state. Might be one thing to somebody over here, something else to somebody over there. Well, the Bible, when it speaks to us, the Bible word that is used there for world, it's talking about that system that is anti-God, a mindset that is contrary to God's way. So our external enemy is the world. I want to see, I want you to see our internal enemy. Our internal enemy is the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, we read these words. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I am warning you about these things as I warned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice in that uh, passage of Scripture, it talks about the flesh, our internal foe. When the Bible speaks about our flesh, it's not talking about the skin. It's not talking about the sinew. It's not talking about the bones, our eyes, our nerves. Romans chapter 12, 1 tells us that we are to present our bodies to God as a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says... Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? So when you look at the Bible, it's not talking about our physical bodies in terms of uh, being a foe in this sense of the word. It's talking about our bodies are not evil, that God made our bodies and our bodies are to be given to God and that God carries out His will through our physical bodies. Now when the Bible uses the word flesh, it means that predisposition to sin that we all have, that old Adamic nature that we got from our parents. Hey, where'd they get it? They got it from their parents. Well, where'd they get it? Well, they got it from that. It's that old Adamic sin nature that we have and every one of us has a sin nature. Now, uh, you want some evidence of that, just go down to the nursery. Uh, no parent has to teach their child to be selfish. We think that up on their own. Parents have to teach their children to be unselfish. A little boy spit on his brother, he hit him with a broomstick. Call him a bad boy. Mother was just in the other room. She witnessed it all. And she came running and hollering, and she was just being stern with her son. She said, Son, why did you do that to your brother? The devil made you do that. Well, he thought about that for just a moment. And then he said, Well, he said, The devil made me hit him and call him a bad name, but spitting him was my own idea. <laughs> Now, when you think about it, sometimes it's hard for us to tell what's our own idea and what's just plain old pure flesh. And sometimes we act in the flesh and 
the Bible calls the flesh our internal in enemy, that old Adamic, that sin nature that lies within every one of us. We all deal with it. Well, then thirdly, I want to speak to you about our infernal, infernal foe, who is the devil. Ephesians 6.21 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, spiritual forces in the heavens. We have a real enemy. Lucifer is his name. The devil. He's our foe. He wants to sabotage our lives. He wants to ruin our lives and bring death to happiness and purity and youth and our witness for Christ. The devil is a real spirit being and he has organized evil forces to work at his bidding along his side to carry out his will for us, which is the opposite of God's will for our lives. Now, look at the scripture that we read initially. What did it say? It said to us that no temptation has come upon you except <coughs> what is common to all humanity. Every temptation, friends, that we face comes from one of these three sources. The world, that's our external foe. The flesh, that's our internal foe. Or the devil, that's our infernal foe. Did you know that together these three are the unholy trinity of temptation that constantly works against us? A simple analogy that helps us think of these three areas that are used in every temptation that comes to us. Think of your flesh as a pool of gasoline. Think of the world as a lighted match. And think of the devil as the one who strikes the match and flings it at you. And then you just kind of get a little bit of an idea of how temptation comes about. Now we've talked about the subjects of temptation. And we've also spoken about the source of temptation. But here's why you came to that. I want us to see the subduing of temptation. The subduing of temptation. This is a good one. <laughs> How do we get the victory in the area of temptation? Well, against the world, the key word is faith. Against the world, the key <coughs> word is faith. Think about this with me. 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Everyone who has been born of God conquers the world this is the victory that conquers the world. Our faith, who is the one who conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now the faith that it's talking about in that is not just faith in the general sense. But what it's talking about is it's talking about the faith that sees Jesus as the Son of God. It's talking about that as the source of victory in our lives that helps us overcome the world. A Christian is somebody who has seen Jesus with the eye of faith, realizes how wonderful Jesus is, and finds total satisfaction in Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says this, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now don't misunderstand what that verse says. It doesn't say you don't love the Father because you love the world. That's not what it says. What it says is, it says just the opposite. We love the world because the love of the Father is not in us. Did you get that? Now as far as I know, everybody wants to be satisfied. Suppose you're invite, you invite me over to your house and uh, you say we want you to come over for dinner. You serve me a nice T-bone steak, a really good salad, a baked potato, some iced tea, and to top it all off, I got my choice of key lime pie or banana pudding. Wouldn't that be awesome? Anybody hungry? 
<laughs> now imagine that as I'm leaving your house, we've just had this sumptuous meal together. You've been very gracious, very generous. We've enjoyed our time together. And I'm leaving your house, and I'm walking to my car. And as I'm walking to my car, somebody walks up to me with an old, dirty uh, paper plate. And on that paper plate are a few uh, stale breadcrumbs and an old, uh, sour, old, uh, bad tomato. Here, have all of them. And, and I say, no thank you, I'm satisfied. Listen. When we are fully satisfied in Jesus Christ, we won't find ourselves in a back alley eating out of rusty cans with the devil's belly guns. As the hymn writer says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. A worldly Christian is a believer who is not finding his or her satisfaction in Jesus. But a victorious Christian is somebody who has seen Jesus with the eye of faith, who realizes how wonderful Jesus is, and then sets out to find their total satisfaction in Jesus. So first of all, we have seen in the text that God wanted us to know that against the uh, world, the key word, is faith. Finding our satisfaction in Jesus. Now I want you to notice second, that against the flesh, the key word is flee. Flee. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Paul says to Timothy, he says, flee youthful passions. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, the Bible tells us, flee sexual immorality. This is not a sin that we are told to overcome by fighting. We're just told that we're supposed to sky them up. That means get out of there. Flee as fast as you can. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says this. God is faithful. He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also provide, look here, the way out. Did you know that sometimes the way out is the king's highway? Two legs and a hard run just to get out of there. <laughs> Jesus taught us to pray every day, every morning, start our day. Father, do not lead us into temptation. Don't watch that garbage on TV. Don't look at those bags. Don't search for that on the internet. Why put that stuff in your mind? You're flirting with temptation. Now any man who says he can look at porn and it doesn't have an adverse effect on him is either no man, superman, or a liar. <laughs> Solomon said in Proverbs 6, 27, you can't embrace fire without your clothes being burned. Now, if you're wanting to lose weight, get rid of those Twinkies. Get them out of the house. Every boy has temptations. A friend told me that when he was a youngster, he had a Sunday school teacher who told him that a boy becomes what he thinks about. Listen, friends. If there's any truth to that, I should have turned into a girl. <laughs> a 16-year-old was talking to his grandfather about having lustful thoughts. Looking to his godly grandfather, he asked him, he said, Granddaddy, when does your man ever stop having these thoughts about the opposite sex? And his grandfather looked at him and said, well, I don't know, but it must be sometime after 75. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Parents, when your children go out on a date, put a tracker on your cell phone. They don't need to go to a secluded rendezvous. They need to go to a football game surrounded by 80,000 people. <laughs> and then when they come home, if they know each other well enough, and it's time for that special goodnight kiss, let them, let them do it on the front porch with the light on. <laughs> And Daddy looking through the eye hole with a shotgun. <laughs> this last week, I was invited to be a part of a panel, a discussion panel, with college students. And the majority of these college students were from Ball State Community College uh, there in Gallatin. And, uh, uh, but there were other students from other campuses in Nashville and around the area. But there must have been, I don't know, 75 or 100 college students at this audience. Can you say petrified? I mean, really. So here they are, and they've been given the opportunity to come up with any questions they want to about sex and marriage. Now, thank God, I am not the only person on this band, right? I mean, there are three other couples in addition to my wife, Julie, and myself. And... Uh, they were just asking some basic questions about dating and what's right and what's inappropriate. And the youngest couple who was on the panel answered one of the questions. And they were talking about things that they did to protect themselves when they were dating. Now, the, the wife said that she had had sex before they got married. And so she said, I wanted to give you that as a background just to let you know that Jesus Christ saved me, changed my life, and I had to start all over from point number one on how to do this thing the right way. And I wanted to find a godly man. I mean, I had been down the other road and said, no thank you, that's not for me. That's ruined my life. And I wanted to make a fresh start and so she said, I, I started dating Joel, her husband, and uh, when Joel and I began dating, uh, we set some ground rules. And then she just kind of leaned forward on the couch and she said, let me tell you something, nothing good happens after 11 p.m. <laughs> now we used to say 12. I like her version better. <laughs> and then she said, we made a commitment that we would not kiss while sitting or lying down. We could only kiss while standing up. Now I listened to this wise advice that was coming straight to these college students from someone who had not been out of college all that long herself. But as she was speaking to them, what she was saying is, here's the bottom line. Don't put yourself into those kinds of temptations. You can't reason with or resist the sins of the flesh. God's answer is just to run as fast as you can in the opposite direction. Against the flesh, the key word is flee. Now against the devil, the key word is fight. Against the devil, the key word is fight. Now going back to that Ephesians 6 passage, when it comes to the devil, we are in a battle. Ephesians 6.12, the Bible says this, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Straight talk. Never run from the devil. Never. You can't outrun him. By the time you get to wherever you're going, he will have already beat you to the next spot. He'll be waiting there for you. We're not told to run from the devil. Now, I want to say something to you about the devil. The devil's not omnipresent. The devil is not God. So don't make him out to be God. The devil is not God. He is subservient to God as all creation is. The devil works within limits. 
Now the devil is someone who can't be at all places at all times, but the scripture tells us that he has organized his forces and he has other demons that are working on his part. And it is not, it is, uh, he is not God, but he wants to keep on thinking and acting like he's God. He wants to fool us, to bluff us. Sometimes we may come face to face with, this, with Satan. I can't speak for you. I don't know your experience. That may happen sometimes. But sometimes, much of the time, we come face to face with his demons and it feels just like the evil one himself. When that happens, listen, we're not told to run. We have to turn around and resist the devil and his demons in the name of Jesus Christ. Against the world, faith. Against the flesh, flee. Against the devil, fight. Now some people scoff at the idea of the devil. Well, that's just a fairy tale. That's just a figment of your imagination. And others will boastfully make the claim. I mean, you may be in the company of somebody like this and say, I'm not afraid of the devil. <laughs> Folks, that's the wrong question. The better question is, is the devil afraid of you? He ought to be. He ought to be afraid of you. Every follower of Jesus Christ can come against Satan in the name of Jesus and according to James chapter 4, the Bible tells us that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says this, they conquered him, that is, they conquered the devil, the evil one, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their own lives. We can actually overcome the devil. Now the next time... The devil and his demons get on your trail. You understand he's trying to drive a wedge between you and God. You don't have to take it. You can resist him. But listen up. Here's what you have to do. First. First thing we need to do is we need to make sure there's no unconfessed sin. No unrepented sin in our lives. And then, after we get our heart clean, then, if the devil gets on your trail, you and I can just say to him, devil, I resist you and I rebuke you. I come against you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved. My sin is under the blood of Jesus. I've been twice born. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Your back was broken at Calvary. You have no right. You have no authority in my life. You're a pervert. You are trespassing on somebody else's property. Now be gone. Disciplines of memorizing scripture 
and reading the Word of God and praying it into your life, if you know week to week somebody's going to ask you, tell me about your journal. What did you write about? How did God say to you this week? Recite your verse from memory. Let me tell you what. I'm not pushing a program. I'm pushing Jesus. And all I know is, I like the program we're trying better than the one we're not trying. Amen. Hey, if something else better comes along someday, I'm not going to say we're not going to do that. I'm not married. My identity's not tied up in this. My identity's tied up in Christ. I'm just trying for my own sake. I'm, hey, I'm in a deep room. Every week on Tuesday morning, I meet with a group of guys at 10 a.m. every Tuesday. I say my verses just like they do. I share from my journal just like they do. I open up. I share my struggles. We talk to each other. We pray for each other. Listen, you know the reason why I do that? Because I know I won't do it if I don't have somebody holding me accountable. Now stop digging your heels on this thing and fight me about it. <laughs> and let's get on with the business at hand. We're talking about falling in love with Jesus. Amen. Amen. And it takes discipline to do it. The way of the world is just to kind of face the rocks, run. <laughs> Let me come to church and hear what I hear. <laughs> play what I want to play. Say what I want to say. What? <laughs> To me, friends, against the world faith, fall in love with Jesus, against the flesh, flee. Get out of there. And against the devil, fight. We can resist the devil because the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. so that our temptations are turned into triumph. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for all that you have done for us. You know today, if you're here in this place and you have yet to trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I hope that through this message, the thing that you have heard is this. You can't beat Him on your own. That's a losing battle. You can't defeat Him in the flesh. But you can through Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus deals in? New futures. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. We have new desires. Uh, new plans are given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an exciting time when you come to know Jesus. Now today, you know, it would just not be right if I didn't invite you to take Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. In fact, I want to urge you to do I can't make you do anything. But can I tell you, when I came to Christ, there were some things that I had to give up because I couldn't follow Jesus and keep doing those things. But let me tell you, anything that was precious to me that I gave up, God more than replaced with so many better, many, uh, better things for me than I have known before coming to Christ. I want to encourage you to give your life to Christ. And today, we're going to have a time of prayer. And today, maybe you would make this your prayer. Father, I want to take Jesus into my life to be my Savior now. I ask you to save me, to forgive me of my sin. Come into my life, Jesus. I take you as my Savior and Lord. The end of our service this morning, if you've made that your prayer for the first time, I want you to know that God wants you to go public with your decision. 
In fact, a lot of people will tell you, as long as I kept the news to myself, I kept on tripping up, it was easy to fall down. But you know, when you tell somebody about it, what you find is you've got a lot of other people to encourage you to help you. If you would make that your decision today, I'm going to ask some of our spiritual counselors to be down here, remain with me down here at the end of the service following the dismissal this morning. They'll stay here for just a moment for you to be able to speak with one of them. And they'll pray with you and help you seal that decision, confirming it, getting solid in your heart and in your life. So I want to encourage you to do that today. Maybe today you can say, I'm interested in uh, getting plugged in to New Hope Baptist Church. I'd like to talk with you about that decision. If that's your desire, please mention that to me as we conclude today. We're going to go into a time of offering right now. And then we're going to have a grand celebration. A big hard to after our time of walk. So this morning I'm asking our ushers to come forward at this time as we prepare to receive our offering. Thank you for meeting our needs today and through this offering, God, we worship you. 